Hey guys, remember the Pokemon fad in the 90s? They were like pogs that, you know, you like, yo, Phoebus H. Charmander. There are, by conservative counts, about 78 trillion Pokemon clones out there in the world today, so should the makers of those games feel guilty? Well, I mean, yes, obviously, but for what reason? Was Pokemon absolutely the first game of its kind? And if not, does it really matter? Apparently, if you put Pokemon with anything, it just instantly makes money. All right, all right, that makes sense to me. Let me see. Just excuse me, guys. Just for uh, just for one sec. Let's see, title. Pokemon gone wrong. Gone sexual. Pokemon. I wonder where I'm gonna put my loot crate at. But was Pokemon really such a groundbreaking game, or did it just rip off 16th century Chinese literature? I'm going with the former on this one. Pokemon is an outstanding franchise. What's not to love? I mean, apart from its satanic observance of evolution and briefly hospitalizing 680 odd children in the 90s, the devil. This is the devil! You've got these monsters, you catch the monsters, and then you make them bite each other for cash, sadistic amusement, and glory. It's like cockfighting with really cute cocks. Editor Josh, remember to Google really cute Cocks. Now, Pokemon was a really original idea. Nobody had ever done exactly what Satoshi Tajiri did in those heady days of the Game Boy. And, and whatever people say about Digimon, Pokemon was actually the earlier of the two. For those that don't know, Digimon is a monster-catching, battling and training game that started off actually only vaguely similar to Pokemon. According to Poke History, Game Freak actually started Pokemon in 1989, but various delays caused it to be released in 1996, 20 years ago and around one year before the rise of Digimon. But Pokemon was not the first game that allowed you to capture your enemies and force them to kill each other for your amusement. That was called the Holy Roman Empire. <laughs> yeah, eat it, antiquity. So, what happened? what happened? What came first? And why didn't any of those other earlier games ever get to be the very best? No one ever was. Come with me, and we'll take a journey down the wormhole of video game history. This is Which Game First? Now, I want to be absolutely clear here. The games I'm talking about probably didn't influence Pokemon much, if at all. There were enough influences that read... The red? There were enough influences that led to Pokemon without claiming one game or another game secretly fed Stasoshi-san everything he needed. The name Pokemon is a portmanteau of the phrase Pocket Monsters. So it's... Only appropriate that we start with the 1980s franchise, Monsters in My Pocket. Long before Pokemon came out, this collection of trading card toys, and, and let's just say a whole bunch more. They even had battle cards in 1992. <laughs> <and> <laughs> Undead zombie. Undead zombie. It's real good, guys. That's good. Now, these were your traditional monster monsters. Your Draculas, your Frankensteins, your Hindu gods. Look at them monsters jumping out of them jeans. Yeah, you break out of their butt magic. They were an American invention, so maybe they hadn't been heard of by Game Freak. But there was a video game made by Konami, a Japanese developer. It was actually not bad, making it the first collectible pocket monsters game for a Nintendo system. Now, I'm not saying that Pokemon stole any ideas from Pocket Monsters. It may have been a coincidence, or they may have just had a gleaming that there was something kind of similar, but it is a bit weird that the name of the game is Pokemon. I mean, Pokemon don't live in your pocket. They live in Pokeballs. The game really should be called Ball Monsters. Hey, Editor Josh, remember to Google Ball Monsters? We want to be able to get some pictures of Ball Monsters. But the name Pocket Monsters isn't what makes Pokemon so unique. The idea of capturing and training critters you find in the field seemed to be an original idea when it came out. Pokemon may have been in development from the late 80s, but the mid to late 90s when it actually came out was the crucible for enemy brainwashing and virtual pooping games. Pokemon was already riding on the tide of digital and handheld feed and watch die games, including dogs and cats from 1995 and 96. Around this time, the first Tamagotchis hit Japanese soil like a 
a dead kamikaze pilot, only uh, exciting and fun for kids. Tamagotchis were the mobile solution to owning a non-living pet. Like carrying taxidermy you still have to feed and bathe, they exploded across primary schools in Japan and North America, and also possibly Europe where they would have been way more expensive for whatever reason. These toys were followed by the aforementioned Digimon in 1997, and even Neopets, a web-based animal raising sim that dropped in 1999. Neopets! Web-based gaming in 1999? 1999! You still had to download porn from Usenet in 99. You still had to search on Metacrawler in 99. People partied like it was! And these games didn't involve a whole lot of training or battling. Two clear distinctions for Pokemon. Unlike, say, Shin Megami Tensei? Oh, you didn't think I'd mention that, do you, huh? Think you pretty much got this whole internet thing wrapped up in a little bow. Well, I got a thing for you, buddy. A ticket to wrong town. Population new. In the 80s and 90s Shin Megami Tensei, you could catch just over 60 unique demons, each with their own abilities and personalities. These demons started off as enemies squaring off with your hero with the intent to eat them or drag them to hell or whatever demons do. When you talk to them, you had the chance to recruit one in exchange for an item or other gift. You could have seven demons on your team at one time, and three to take with you into battle. Not only did this early game have battles, collecting, training, leveling, and so on, it also had a mechanic akin to Pokemon breeding or evolution, known as the fusion system. This fusion system allowed two demons to be unified to form a whole new monster. <laughs> Each demon also had their own race associated with abilities, fusions, strengths, and weaknesses. And yes, there were dragon, fairy, and flying types, among a whole bunch more. Oh, did I mention this game came out for the Famicom in 1987, before Pokemon was even a spark in Game Freak's eye? There was also a sequel shortly after, and a full-fledged Super NES remake to get, to, and get this, 1992. Just five. One year before the birth of Pokemon. This time, the game had over 200 demons to collect and train, and like its predecessors, this franchise was huge in Japan, supporting the original novel, 14 anime series, more than 40 music albums, and eventually 8 different manga series, oh, uh, yes, more than 50 video games. So, why haven't you heard of Shin Megami Tensei? Well, first of all, you probably have. Not only has the Tensei series finally made an impact on North America with the Devil's Summoner games, the massively popular Persona series is a spin-off of, you guessed it, Shin Megami Tensei. And Persona is not small in North America. It's maybe considered a little indie compared to other games, but it's pretty well known. Second, while the series was huge in Japan, a version of these early games never made it to North America until the PlayStation, months after Pokemon had begun its world takeover. The reason for the delay? Well, nobody can say for sure, but it might just be the dark tone steeped in demonic lore. I mean, hell, Pokemon was a colorful kids game by comparison with surprisingly deep gameplay but it got the games are the devil treatment pretty hard. Let's see role play. Pokemon world is a world of the demonic, of the satanic. The case closed, right? Pokemon must have at least borrowed a few ideas from Megami Tensei, the originator of monster catching RPGs, right? Not even close. There are dozens of other games with these mechanics, some with big names like Lufia 1 and 2, Dragon Quest, and maybe even Final Fantasy? Now if you go back far enough, you get into some iffy comparisons. For instance, Wizards of War, which kind of looks like how they would say they had a whiz on the wall in Northern England. Oh, you're so, you know, having a whiz on the wall. It was an 80s C64 game where you solved mazes and took on increasingly challenging hellhounds. There was no monster capturing or monster training mechanics per se, but you could pit the monsters against each other, I think? Okay, but there's also the slightly closer Mail Order Monsters, an action strategy game from 1985. We've got to get this video game back to 1985! An early game designed by Paul Ritchie! Hey! Hey, Paul Ritchie, you've continued- oh, no, 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 never mind, it's a different Paul Ritchie. Hey, no, did I mention you could even put your creations on a diskette and battle and share with friends in 1985? 
Okay, so you're probably saying in unison, okay, okay come, come on, on. These, these are a huge stretch. stretch. In the Tensei series, you actually capture and train your foes met in the field. Surely nothing else came close to Pokemon in design or style. Well, ladies and gentlemen, and the actual people watching this video, I hope, let me introduce you to Destiny of an Emperor. Now, nobody talks about this game in relation to Pokemon, and that turns me. You see, that was a bit too much pain. You see, Destiny of an Emperor, based on a 16th century Chinese novel, was one of the more interesting RPGs I played as a kid, and not a lot of people remember it. I mean, the subject matter seems a bit obscure by North American standards, and on the surface, it appears to be your standard side-facing RPG, but Destiny of an Emperor broke the tradition that had honestly barely been established to this point by having no one-on-one -on -one direct battles whatsoever. Destiny, that's right, it gets that word now, screw you Bungie and the Larry Niven's ring world you rode in on. In Destiny, you sent out your armies to do battle, standing at the back like any good coward, I mean general. Your generals only died when they ran out of horse fodder, standing aside and letting others do the work. Sound familiar? But that isn't the main connection. In the manga, Liu Bei fights to unite China during the Warring States period. To represent this, the game actually allows you to capture select generals from the manga and the novel with all of their soldiers. Rather than joining the rank and file, these generals were your party members. Just like Pokemon rounded up in the field became your willing murder slaves. And there were 150 generals, the exact same number as there were Pokemon in Generation 1, each with their own abilities, stats, and characteristics. And, just like Pokemon, you couldn't have them all in your party at once. There was a general tent that operated much like a Poke Center, where you could store these generals and their massive arms. You can use an item to keep enemies away, like this, uh... Nobody told me it's this kind of party. All right, everybody, let's get so rolling. See, did Destiny of an Emperor in 1990 cause Pokemon to exist six years later? The hats. No, but it was one of a myriad of games that must have had some influence on the development of Pokemon. And even if it didn't, there's another question we can answer here. When we're talking about the concept of monster capturing, we don't need to ascribe it just to one game or one series, and we don't need to limit ourselves to playing just that one series. If you get tired of Pokemon, if you think the designs are stupid, there are so many other games to try out that have similar mechanics. If you want to develop your own game, you have a lot of things to draw on that you maybe didn't try in the first place. Pokemon is a rich universe with a lot of cute designs. But when we look back at the first monsters in people's pockets, the first virtual pets, the first games to have capturable enemies, we can see there's a vast world of concepts to draw on. It's not that Pokemon isn't creative because there were other games that came before it, but there's a lot to learn by looking at the history of any one game. Maybe we can learn just as much about game design, about what works and doesn't, by trying to answer the question, which game first? Uh. Hey, I hope you enjoyed my first of the series. If you liked it, let me know. Sub, whatever you want. If I get some likes, I'll make some more. I've got lots of ideas for which came first history, you beautiful rat bastards. If this wasn't your thing, be sure to check out my brother and I as we mock our way through every game ever made instead. We've got a lot of different kinds of content, so hopefully there's something for each of you. See you soon! Hey Josh, make sure to Google cute cocks with cute monster balls smoking pot. Okay, thanks.